Welcome back to Optimal Flight at QuarantineCon 2020. I am Brandon. I'm Steven. And we have been whiling away the hours of social distancing, uh, talking to each other and to you about the worst cards in the Arkham Horror card game. Um, I have been looking to trim down the amount of cards that I carry around with me, and the great old ones we are hoping will uh, bless our chaos bag in return <laughs> for sacrificing these cards to them. That would be wonderful if we could just go through like one game without the auto fail. Yeah, that's probably never happened in the history of Arkham Horror. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure it's never happened to me. Um, so we talked about Guardian, Seeker, and Neutral cards last time. Found some real winners, losers. Uh, <laughs> that video went on for like 43 minutes. <laughs> Turns out it's fun talking about bad cards. It went on. <laughs> we had more to say than we thought. So <laughs> buckle up. If the goal is to waste time while you're in quarantine, uh, we're here for you. <laughs> You mean brilliantly spend your time? Yes, yeah, wisely spend your time with us. Yes. Anyway, shall we dive into Rogue? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so I've got another five cards per class that I plan to never put in a deck ever again. Starting with the Rogue Classic Switchblade. It's a level zero one cost asset. It's got a lot of traits, I'll give it that. It's an item, a weapon, it's melee, and it's illicit. It's fast. Takes up a hand slot and says, as an action fight, if you succeed by two or more, this attack deals plus one damage. So, we said several times in the previous video that the number one thing you want out of a weapon is extra damage. This does give that. Yeah. Seems great. It, it does seem great. Uh, but then, the other thing that it needs is to help you hit. Right? And this doesn't have that. Um, rogues generally don't have as much combat out of the gate as Guardians, so they really need their weapons to provide a boost. This one not only doesn't help you hit, but doesn't give you that second point of damage if you don't <laughs> spectacularly succeed. Uh, it, being fast is cool. It can come into play when there's an enemy already engaged with you, but then it just basically lets you do a default fight. <laughs> so why would you play it? <laughs> so that's where I'm at. <laughs> This is not quite the card that I'm going to defend from the rogues, mm -hmm. but the one thing I will say is that if you try building Tony, it's actually surprisingly hard to get him up to the like standard like five weapons that you would put in a fighter. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, at least at level zero. Even right. if you take Guardian as your subclass, you can't take Guardian weapons. Right. So like you sometimes have to include one of these just to like get him up to the like reasonable level of weapons. <sighs> yeah, that's true. Um, we talked last time about Kukri also never being worth playing, but I think I'd play that over this if I was oh, that desperate no, for weapons. No, no. I think I might. Lucis is fast, so, like, if you have to discard it when you get a good weapon, you don't feel like you wasted time. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, and it's cheap. I think it's cheaper than Kukri at one resource. Um, yeah, all right. You're right, I haven't yet built a Tony deck. I'm actually planning to for the game we're going to play together after filming this. Maybe I'll immediately eat my words and take this out of the sacrifice pile. <laughs> I guess we'll see, but um, no, I think one of up there with Blackjack in the worst weapons of the game territory. Yeah. All right, I'll take your silence as uh, I should move on to the next card. Hired Muscle. It's a level one, one cost rogue ally asset. It's also a criminal. It says, you get plus one combat. That's great. Forced at the end of the upkeep phase, you must either pay one resource or discard hired muscle. Uh, he does soak three damage or one horror. Uh, this, so there's, um, I'm blanking on the name of the other ally with the same, like, pay their uh, salary. Treasure Hunter? Thank you, yeah, Treasure Hunter. The, this, I mean, the problem with this, if you got three resources per turn innately or something, Jenny does get two, so maybe she's the only one to be interested in this. But this is you giving your entire income, your entire natural income, <laughs> to this ally just for one point of that. So I made this joke last time, but it, it applies again this time. I would do K Preston um, if we were not in the middle of quarantine. Um, he can totally afford this. Why shouldn't he have some hired muscle? He's a rich asshole. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you're right. I haven't tried it in Preston. I think it's, it's, it's he's all right in Preston. 
And Pre- Preston's natural stats are what one though. Yeah, but like giving he... plus one to his stats just doesn't really like he needs to be spending that money on things that are just going to automatically succeed. But so when I played Preston, that like I actually got the stats up pretty high because like you can throw in Dark Horse, you get you get like plus six from Fire Axe, like you can get his stats up pretty high. Um, and he's also a good soak. This is a good combo with Dark Horse because uh, half the time if you have Dark Horse, you're choosing not to take that money anyway. This time you just take it and immediately spend it on Hired Muscle. Uh, no, it's at the end of the upkeep phase. Which is right when you've gotten the resource. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, good point. <laughs> um, yep. Um, and I also think maybe worth a look in Leo DeLuca because... Um, Leo Anderson? The Leo, Leo? Leo? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I, I was like, I know there's two Leos. I should say the last name to distinguish them. <laughs> I just said the wrong last name. Um, but because you're not paying an action to play them, like, you can just kind of kill them off right away. Um, like, just, like, use them for a turn oh, for the plus Leo. one, and then, you know, just mm. use them for soak and kill them off pretty quickly. That's a good point. Um, okay, maybe I'm a little too hasty on this. Uh, you're right, that... So that's that's really I think the takeaway. If you're going to put this in your deck, it needs to be with the intent of killing him pretty soon, right? Like really utilizing the soak, not just paying for one point of stat the whole time. Yeah. Hmm. All right. This is one of the ones so far that I'm the most like maybe being talked back out of. But you won't talk me out of retiring stealth. <laughs> the two cost rogue asset. It's a talent. It doesn't take up a slot. As an action, you can exhaust stealth to evade. The chosen enemy gets minus two evade for this evasion attempt. But if you successfully evade the enemy, disengage with it and do not exhaust it. Until the end of your turn, that enemy cannot engage you. So it's an asset that you pay for, spend actions on, <laughs> all those things you do with the assets, just to do like kind of a weird half evade. Yeah. An evade that is only useful if you're going to leave and the enemy's not a hunter. Mm-hmm. And also if you don't have any other investigators at your location. Yeah. Like maybe in true solo there's a use case for this, but uh when it came out, I remember trying it and just basically always staring at it in my hand and never putting it on the table because it just seemed mm-hmm. like if it were on the table it wouldn't do anything for me. Yeah. And even in true solo, the fact that it doesn't prevent hunters from moving towards you is kind of weird. Like um, so I feel like it's not great in true solo, and then it's like terrible in multiplayer. Yeah. And finally, what does? Oh, I guess it's a cop like hiding behind it. This is very dark art. Yeah. I thought this was cars driving down a street or something, and I was like, "What does that have to do with stealth?" But... Art's too bad. You just can't play it. Yeah. Again, it's art is too, also too disqualifying. Dark. Mm-hmm. Knuckle duster, another rogue weapon, uh, another Tony option. It is a two cost asset. Item, weapon, melee, illicit as well. As an action, you can fight. This asset deal, or excuse me, this attack deals plus one damage. The attacked enemy gains retaliate for this attack. So you've upgraded over the switchblade because you're guaranteed the plus one damage. But if you miss, which you're as likely as ever to do because it's not giving you any combat skill, (laughs) you get retaliated by the enemy no matter what that means to the enemy. Um, I do like the art. That's all I can really say for it. It's also one of the first mentions of Naomi, who finally appears mm. in um, the Return to Dunwich Legacy. But it's kind of cool that they were laying those seeds uh, in the corset. Oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah. And I think Naomi probably, I- I'll bet she's in some um, investigator stories in like either the novellas or... Yeah, yeah. Or uh, I-, I bet that she was already part of the Arkham mm-hmm. lore. This isn't just purely foreshadowing. Sure. yeah, yeah. Um, I will say, and oh, this was in Carcosa, so maybe it's not the first example, but I do love when rogue cards get, uh, titles that are, like, the, the, like, slang name for this weapon. Like, oh, fun Arkham history, mm-hmm. the Knuckle Duster was the original, um, criminal, or, um, uh, rogue icon, and they decided to switch it. <laughs> That's right. Uh, after the first printing of the corset. Yeah, some people, uh, it wasn't even after the first printing. I think it was just that the first printing had, in error, had it, like, on skids mm, or something right. like that. Yeah, uh, yeah. the, the rogue icon was going to be the, the brass knuckles in that yeah. green diamond, and it changed to, I guess, kind of, like, earrings? I'm not sure exactly what the rogue icon currently is supposed to evoke. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, that, is, that is a fun fact. Thank you for that. Doesn't really do anything for the card. <laughs> 
And, oh, you know, Rogue, I think, is the only one with a lot of allies coming up here. Uh, I guess we we did talk about a seeker ally, but... Yeah. Henry Wan, the aspiring actor. Uh, we, we're surrounded by those in L.A. <laughs> uh, three cost ally assets. That he's an ally and a criminal. As an action, you can exhaust him. One at a time, reveal random tokens from the chaos bag until you choose to stop or until you reveal a bad stuff token. Bad stuff symbol. If you choose to stop, for each token revealed via this effect, you may either draw one card or gain one resource. But if you revealed a symbol, do nothing. Oh, so, fun text to fantasize about, right? <laughs> you look at these, you're like, I could get four or five cards of resources per use. You can even split that up, two cards, two resources. Like, seems great, but the odds are not in your favor on this. No, I think on average you're going to get, like, one one resource, maybe one and a half resource per action, which, like, yeah, you can just click for a resource. Yeah, I think, so if you... Yeah, like, you would only use him if you were going to get at least two out of it, right? Or if you expect to. Yeah. But it, I think if you push to even just the second token, like, the odds are not in your favor of yeah. getting, of not just getting nothing. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, in theory, I like the, the this um, evocation of the rogues, like, push your luck kind mm -hmm. of kind of theme. It's a cool design, but, man, the, the balance is just not right. <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, have you ever, my one thought was like, maybe if you're playing with an ally that is uh, another investigator that is really focusing on bag manipulation and taking these tokens out, have you ever tried that or thought about it? It wouldn't even necessarily have to be another investigator because there is a deck called Sealfina um, <laughs> that does have a lot of bag manipulation. Um, I'm not familiar. Does that deck play Henry Wan? So it was created before uh, Henry Wan. Oh, okay. the Sealfina that I saw in Arkham DB. Mm -hmm. um, but... I mean, even then, it's like having to have your whole deck set up before you get this guy in order for him to be, like, positive. Um, I don't think it's worth it. Yeah. Yeah, and it costs three resources to play him on the table, too. Yeah. So you have to get at least... So for him to be worth playing, since you're also putting actions into him, like, you mm -hmm. have to get... To break even, you have to get three more resources than you're putting actions into him. So you have to get two or more at least yeah. three times. It's not like he has great soak. He's just one two, which mm -hmm. is, you know, one of the lower amounts of soak. Yeah, so allies. like most aspiring actors, <laughs> not, a, not a big future for Henry Watt. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. All right. Uh, oh, one last thing. Um, he's from the Circle Undone cycle. I think of the cards that I picked, uh, he is the most single most recent one. Mm -hmm. I, for the most part, was looking at older ones because the newer ones I either haven't had enough time to try mm -hmm. or just ha they maybe will still will see that combo piece that they need. Um, but no, I just don't see any redeeming possibility for him. I can't imagine a feasible card that would make him... <laughs> You know, well. <laughs> have you asked Anna Kaslow, like, in the future, like, will there be a use for Henry Wan? I mean, like, a card that makes allies' actions fast or something like that. It's like, <laughs> your allies' abilities that would require an action are instead fast or something like that. Maybe, but until something wild like that. No, I don't think even Anna could have anything to say. Mm, okay. All right. Um, going to Mystic, a core set classic, Scrying. It's a one cost asset, level zero. It's a spell and takes up an arcane slot, uses three charges and says, as an action, exhaust Scrying and spend one charge. Look at the top three cards of any investigator's deck or the encounter deck. Return them to the top of that deck in any order. So there are a lot of people who are fairly high on this when it came out, I recall. And I recall fighting with a lot of people on the internet uh surprise isn't this a corset card yeah isn't that what i said you said when it came out as if it like came out after the game i don't know oh no when when it when the corset yeah. came out yeah um a lot of people thought really highly of this and you know it turns out seeing into the future slightly but having no power to change that future is not worth a resource a card and three actions and an arcane slot <laughs> I have actually played this in Marie Lambeau because you can play it as a fast action. Hmm. And it's it's okay. Like I still took it out after a few scenarios. Yeah. But like, what did you what did you do with the knowledge that it gave you? 
Well, you can try to arrange it so that, like, your if your mystic is more, like, set up for investigating, that the monsters go to, like, your fighter. Um, or if your mystic does have shriveling out, then you can take them take the monsters. Um, obviously, you can put will treacheries to your mystic. So it's like, yeah, it, it's got some stuff. It's probably not worth an action, but when it's free with Marie, it's okay. Rearranging the encounter deck, yeah, that is kind of its one use in, like, in I guess even in solo, you could theoretically... An enemy that you don't want to show up, you could push it back by two cards three times and just let the whole game go by and never draw it, maybe. Yeah. But you're still spending a lot of actions to do that to where maybe you might as well have just drawn it and dealt with it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pretty weak. Um, so <laughs> this is the only situation uh, where I did this for this set of cards, but the next card is Scrying Level 3. <laughs> it's a one-cost asset still, a spell, still takes an arcane slot, still has three charges. It is fast to use it and spend one charge, oh, excuse to exhaust it and spend one charge. Look at the top three cards of any Investigator's deck or the Encounter deck, return them to the top of that deck in any order. If a Terror or Omen card is among the looked-at cards, take one horror. So, I kind of put this in here to prove a point that the previous one was really far from being good. Because <laughs> this one is significantly better in that it doesn't take an action each time you mm -hmm. use it, but it still returns them to the top of the deck, so there's not that much you can do about what's coming, mm -hmm. really. Yeah. And it gives an added punishment <laughs> if you see these very common traits for encounter cards. Yeah. <sighs> Have you ever tried this one? No, because for Marie, it's like not as relevant that it's fast. Uh, um, yeah. And yeah, you're right. Like Terra and Omen are pretty common. Um, I mean, if the problem is like if the first scrying was good, then you could upgrade to this one easily with Arcane Research. But like that requires that you put the first scrying in your deck. Yeah. Um, so which most decks don't want to do. Um, so yeah, like not great. No, and it, it just... I find it laughable that for a level three card, which should be a, a fairly significant improvement over the previous one, which switching to a fast action is, that it added a punishment <laughs> as a, as a trade-off. Yeah. Like, scrying did not need, like, something to balance out the fact that you made it better in a different way. Yeah. Did not need that. Um, I do like the art because it's like, it's the ghoul priest being seen in kind of a cup of coffee. It's a little bit of like a twin oh, you PC. Oh, you think it's being seen there? I thought it was just a hipster barista, like, was really good at making <laughs> foam ghoul priest. <laughs> you know, whichever one of those explanations it is, I like it. So, yeah. yeah. Scrying, good art, bad card. Song of the Dead. The, I think, first alternative that the game got to shriveling yep. was kind of exciting at the time just because... If you were a mystic and wanted to kill things, mm -hmm. it was shriveling, shriveling, shriveling. Yeah. But it's bad. Uh, it's a level two, two cost mystic spell and a song. Takes up an arcane slot, uses five charges, and as an action, you can spend one charge to fight. The attack gain or uses willpower instead of combat. You get plus one willpower for the attack. But if a skull symbol is revealed during the attack, this attack deals plus two damage. I mean, I feel like we're just gonna we're just repeating ourselves basically like at least once per class, but without the guaranteed extra damage, it's not worth your actions. Yeah, I mean, with Jim, he has a slightly higher chance of of getting it, especially if you're using grotesque statue. That was clearly the idea was that this is a Jim card, but Jim's also like generally considered pretty bad, right? Like the whole. The whole thing with Jim, like, not minding slash being rewarded for skull tokens and then also drawing them a little more often, it seemed cool and it felt innovative, but it just never really added up to much. Yeah, I will say my experience with, like, people that build very combo gym Jim decks where it's like, oh, if I get this card, this card, this card, and this card, then I'll be really strong, is that, like, they never actually get all those cards out <laughs> on the board in time for it to matter. Yeah. Know? So, um, your combos need to be either simple enough or, uh, flexible enough that you can get them on the table in the first half of the game, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or at least you need to be pretty good until you get the combo out, um, and yeah. Song of the Dead's not, not great until you mm -hmm. get some more support for it. And I think this would have been an interesting alternative to Shriveling if it was level zero. At level two, though, mm -hmm. like, uh, is it, Shriveling has two, level two and level five versions? 
yes. Think, so three and five. Three, three and five. five. Okay, so it's not directly comparable to a, a specific level of shriveling, but I think you're way better off spending your XP on shriveling three. Yeah, so like unlike shriveling three, like Daisy can play this, but I don't think Daisy wants to play this. <laughs> like, yeah, true. And you did mention arcane research earlier. Um, shriveling also has the benefit of having a level of zero version you can upgrade from, yeah. and Song of the Dead does not, so you're paying its full too, yeah. no matter what. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no redeeming value. Defiance. So this one's, uh, it's better than Book of the Dead, Song of the Dead. I'll give it that. Uh, it's a mystic skill with a will icon, or excuse me, a wild icon. It's innate and says, before revealing chaos tokens for this test, choose one of the following symbols. And it's any of the special symbols that are not auto fail. Ignore the effects of the chosen symbol during this test, including its modifier. I do love its flavor text, which is no. Um, I played some of this in when the card pool was much smaller, but do you see it having much place now? I actually see this in like every Diana deck, um, and oh, a be decent number of, uh, Mystic decks. So it is an ignore effect. Now you have to actually hit the symbol to trigger Diana. That's the thing. Like, I don't even think it's like, I've played it in Diana and never once hit the symbol that I needed. I guess I don't think that I was comboing it in... Like, before I got Grotesque Statue or anything like that that gives me extra tokens, I think I was, for the most part, um, level, like removing this as I leveled up my deck before I got those things that would help me combo with it. But, I don't know, this card, that its main purpose is there's a chance that it will go under Diana. Uh, but also, like, there are times when it's like there's one Chaos token that you're really worried about and you don't care about the other ones, so... I don't know. Like, to me, I would play this in a Mystic over Unexpected Courage. Like, yeah, you get one less hmm. Wild Icon, but you still get one Wild Icon, and you have to pick a Chaos token of your choice. So, like, to me, this is the Mystic card that I would definitely defend. Like, there are some edge cases in maybe Marie and Jim for the other ones, but, like, this one, I I still think is a good Mystic card. Yeah, I see the value for, in, in specific scenarios, if there's a token that's, like, the boss attacks you when you draw this token. Like, being able to cancel that can be nice, but it's so niche. I don't see... Unless I'm, like, adaptable and can put this in for certain scenarios based on what its token effects are, I don't I don't see it. I think I would play Unexpected Courage over this. I think uh, it's where yeah, I stand. That's, yeah. that's too expected. <laughs> One more Mystic skill is uh, the last Mystic card on the list. Torrent of Power. It is a level zero skill with a wild icon. It's practiced, so practice makes perfect, can't find it. I'll give it that. Uh, but as an additional cost to commit it to a skill test, spend up to three charges from among assets you control. For each charge spent in this way, Torn to Power gains a willpower and a wild icon. Uh, the, so what it's asking you to do is spend charges that represent entire uses of your spells just to make whatever you're doing more likely to succeed this one time and you probably to make this a really great skill card it's got to or to make this like worth its slot in your deck you've got to spend at least one mm -hmm. to make it really great and probably pass the test even the worst of tests mm -hmm. it's got to spend at least two i don't, I don't yeah. know why I and the fact that half the icons you're getting are will icons like generally by the end like you should be really good at will tests, you know? Yeah. Like, if it was too wild, it's like, okay, that would let me evade anyone I wanted to. You're right. Investigate anywhere I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But, like, you shouldn't need seven will, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. in addition to your base will. Like, that should be ridiculously overkill for most things that Mystic do. Yeah, you compare this to what the other classes can have in the way of cards that they have to jump through, um jump through a hoop but they get like three or more wild mm -hmm. icons like is it true understanding that i think is three wilds play only when there's a no cool uh, location true understanding is one wild you're thinking of inquiring mind inquiring mind yeah that is just way more likely to yeah. be so not only is it a large cost that might set you back going forward but also you might find yourself wishing you could play this and you haven't played around it to leave charges on the table right yeah and it's it's similar to blood eclipse in that you're you're spending three very valuable things for something that's like kind of underwhelming yeah um pretty cool art it mm -hmm. seems to uh match up well with the name of the card that said <laughs> <laughs> 
We are down to Survivor, uh, starting in the core set with Baseball Bat. It is a zero cost, excuse me, level zero, two cost asset. It's an item, a weapon, and melee. As an action fight, you take, you get plus two combat for this attack. This attack deals plus one damage. Like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm with that so far. But if you draw a skull or auto fail symbol during the attack, you discard Baseball Bat after the attack resolves. And it takes up both hand slots. To me, that is the killer, is the two hand slots. So I did not tell you which card I was going to defend beforehand. Uh -huh. um, normally in, you know, dramatic things, you want to save the, the, the surprise for the last. In this case, I'm going to defend the very first card. Whoa! Um, so Baseball Bat is an integral card in any kind of Wendy deck that spams World of Survive. Uh, she only has mm. one fight, so you really need something that's going to boost her fight up a lot. You don't care about the downside of the skull or auto fail because you're playing World of Survive a lot. Yeah. Um, she doesn't really need other hand slots. Um, I mean, obviously, like flashlight occasionally, but like you can use that up. Um, I I've never seen like a real like spammy Wendy deck um, where you're just trying to never take tasks that does not rely heavily on baseball. Hmm. Okay, that's a good point. It has a one very specific build that still uses it. Uh, okay, I really don't have a rebuttal to that, other than I haven't played that specific build of Wendy and don't know when I will. Um, I do really like the tone that it set for, like, here's how survivor weapons work. Mm -hmm. Like, they're gonna be whatever piece of junk is lying around, <laughs> and they may, um, like, I think they've continued to... Maybe Fire Axe is the least like this, but they generally have like a chance of either backfiring mm -hmm. or not working as you want them to. Yeah. They cause horror. Like I, I love the design and I love the um, the way that this sets that tone. Yeah. But yeah, I don't think I'm gonna put it in a deck again. <laughs> Spammy Wendy decks are actually like the ones that tend to be expert because they like don't mm. pull any tokens. So um... yeah, I know I'm not an expert player, <laughs> but I know that that is. The way expert players tend to go is towards anything <laughs> testless, right? Yeah. <laughs> because anytime you are reaching your hand into the bag, bad things are going to happen. Yeah, yeah, just done so. <laughs> yeah, and I guess they don't. I guess Wendy doesn't have any other ways to do really more than two damage, right? Or, or really, or really any many I mean, other. You could take an old hunting to. rifle, and yeah. then you would also avoid the damage right. side with World of Survive. But at least at level zero, you're sure you're taking baseball. Damage. Yeah, they don't have a lot of like other options that deal even two damage. I guess when I say more, backstab. more than two, but it's three actually. Uh, backstab, sure, but that's not a that's not repeatable. Yeah. Well, for Wendy, it's slightly. Yeah. All right. Anyway, moving on. Hakina, bafflingly one of the most expensive cards in the game for Survivor at five costs. Uh, the Forgotten Daughter. She's a level one asset. She's an ally and takes up the ally slot. As a reaction, when an enemy attacks you, exhaust Akina and deal one horror to her. To deal that enemy's damage to another enemy at your location instead, you still take the horror dealt by the attack. <laughs> Why? <laughs> the, the cost is... You compare this to Pete, even level zero Pete, who only has two horror, but he heals horror every turn, so in a way he has a lot more horror or a lot more horror soak than yeah. she has. And doesn't he give us two or three? Uh, three, yeah. Three. <laughs> you can get a lot better soak for a lower cost, and then this ability is just so niche that yeah. it's weird that there's two prerequisites. It both has to be an attack where you're more worried about the damage than the horror, mm -hmm. and there has to be another enemy your location. Like it just seems it's too specific. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the the fact that this was a core set survivor ally, like I guess it kind of set the tone of survivors. Like sur survivors have had, have had other cards that redirect damage. Mm. We might even talk about one in a moment. <laughs> uh, none of them have been very great. So it kind of like you look to the core set to set kind of the themes for each class. It she does that, but I I imagine that for anyone who has even put her in a deck, she doesn't usually hit the table at five resources. Like survivors do not generate very many resources. If they do, it's usually rewarding them for having very few. Like with Madame LaBranche, mm -hmm. you're not going to use those cards to get up to five That's to play this. Yeah. yeah, sad. Okay, all right. Actually, speak of the devil. Next up is Oops. It is a two cost survivor event. It does have two combat icons. Anytime a card has two matching icons, like 
I'll consider it because that is a fine use of a card. Mm -hmm. And then any then the opportunity to play it instead of its icons for its text is mm -hmm. like gravy. But it's a fortune that's fast. Play after you fail a skill test by two or less while attacking an enemy engaged with you. Deal this attack's damage to a different enemy at your location. So this has pretty much the same problem as Akina, where the situation is so niche. There have to be two enemies at your location. You have to fail by two or less attacking one. It can't be the auto-fail. Um, actually, it could be the auto-fail if it was an easy attack, mm -hmm. right? That does work yeah. here, unlike yep. Lucky or something. Similar to Look What I Found. Right, yeah. Uh, and then that the damage of your attacker going against that enemy has to be, like, interesting, right? Like, there's no guarantee that you had any plans to kill that enemy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe you were just planning to evade that enemy and yeah. leave and just wanted to kill the other one. Um, I don't know. Have you, I don't think I ever put this in a deck, personally. Did, have you? No, I've never put this in a deck. Yeah. Um... I mean, maybe in the theoretical situation of a survivor where I am putting overpower in... I could consider this as an alternative to the two combat icons, but I would probably rather just play Overpower. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool art, though. It's, uh, I don't know what it has to do with the card, to be honest. It, you can see that in that, like, distance, um, that distant monster, there's, like, an arrow hitting it in the face or something. I think you're probably aiming at the close one and hitting the rear one. Oh, uh, yeah, that... That took me a while to realize. Yeah, but uh, why it's like Cthulhu-esque sea creatures. Why you seem to be firing a bow and arrow from a ship, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, and like the arrow is definitely not coming from where the one monster is reaching for, you know? Because the monster is reaching this way, but yeah. the arrow is coming that yeah, way. Yeah, it's not coming from the perspective of the art. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, yeah, nothing nothing going for it. Okay. Uh, also, Rex can't take it. It's a fortune. <laughs> Unfortunately. Okay, next, I just had that same double take that I had with the Guidance in the last video where I have thought so little about this card that yeah. I had this moment of like, what is this card? It is Hiding Spot. It is a one cost level zero survivor event. It does have two agility icons, I'll give it that. And it's a tactic and a trick, mm -hmm. both relevant traits. Fast, attach Hiding Spot to any location. Each non-elite enemy at attached location gains aloof. Forced at the end of the enemy phase, if a ready enemy is at attached location, discard hiding spot. Uh, flavor text, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, referring to hide and seek. That's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, correct me, actually. I'm interested to know if I'm understanding this wrong, but an enemy engaged with you gaining a loop doesn't make it disengage, right? Uh, it does make it disengage. It does? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So this... Okay, so that's actually a little more interesting than I thought. If you attach this to your location... It makes... Oh, wait, I think so. Well, that's a good question, actually. Yeah, I, don't, could... I, I don't think it does. Oh, yeah, because if you... If you engage an aloof enemy, like like if you ever engage a um, uh, a whippoorwill, mm -hmm. and then you try to kill it and you fail, and so it's still engaged with you over the enemy phase, the next turn it's still engaged with you. Yeah. So yeah, so maybe so having the aloof keyword doesn't bring any rules about like in the enemy phase it disengages or anything yeah, I, like that. I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think it gets enemies off of you. If this thing caused all enemies at the it, if it was that you could put it on any location and all enemies would disengage from investigating yeah. that location, this would be nuts. This would be great. Yeah, but I don't think that's what this does. You're, you're right. This just means that if any enemies hunt into your location, uh -huh. then they won't immediately engage you. But wait, at the end of the enemy phase, this goes away, and then they engage you, right? <laughs> well, you might be in a different location by then. Um, but, but, but hunters only move during the enemy phase. Yeah, well, so if they're a hunter, mm -hmm. then yes, they would move out, and they would engage you and attack you. Um, if they're not a hunter, they would stay there. This would be discarded. So wait, can you explain what is the best case scenario for this card? Uh, How do you get any use out of this card? I'm not seeing literally any purpose. Um, well, it has two agility icons. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point, yep. Uh -huh. um, so best case scenario would probably be you play it on your turn. Um, you end up drawing an enemy. It's aloof. It gives the guardian like time to come to your location and kill the enemy. And there's more flexibility on timing uh, because it's not engaged with you. Sorry. I 
let's back up. At what moment do you play this so it doesn't just engage you? So you play it on your turn, mm -hmm. then that mythos phase, like it doesn't go away in the enemy phase because you have no enemies. Right. Then that mythos phase, you draw an enemy, that enemy is instantly oh. aloof. So it's if you expect to draw an enemy. Yeah. You're right. Then it's aloof for that it, round. It, it can last for several rounds as long as you don't draw any enemies. Right. Um, also, if you move like two away, even if you draw an, a hunter, it's not a big deal. If you if you draw a non-hunter, um, you can obviously move one away and you're fine. Oh, and you know, okay, no, actually, I feel like I just had an epiphany. I think the purpose, so you can attach it to any location. You put this in a location with an enemy that you're about to move into, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You can play this before you move in. Crucially, it does not say any revealed location like most things. Oh, true. So you can do an unrevealed location. Yeah, so you can put it in the location that you want to move into or through mm -hmm. and then move in and those enemies don't engage you at that time. Okay, I feel like for the first time I understand the like purpose of the card <laughs> and I don't think I ever have. Um, whether that's a situation where like you want to move into a location but it's not with the intent of just moving in and killing or evading mm -hmm. so it doesn't hunt that enemy, uh, that feels pretty niche to me. So I actually just played with a friend who was playing Patrice, mm -hmm. uh, and he put this card in his deck. Um, I, I told him, I was like, it seems like you're like low on skill cards for Patrice because she wants to like chuck all of her cards. Yeah. And he was like, well, I'm, I'm just going to play like events that have good icons. Mm -hmm. um, and then like maybe I'll play them and maybe I will just use them for their icons. Um, so I, I, that sort of made sense to me, to be honest. He ended up drawing this at times when we didn't need to evade. Yeah. And it also didn't matter. <laughs> so this this card ended up not mattering at all in the, the game that I played with it. Um, you know, huh. I'm actually like kind of quasi sold on this as a Patrice card because, yes, it has two icons, as we've said every moment we have the opportunity <laughs> during discussing this card. It is its best quality. But the fact that it's fast, it's cheap, and you can attach it to a location and it will stay there. So like it's not... Because Patrice doesn't like cards that you need the stars like the timing to like even less than most investigators she doesn't like when the timing has to be just right for a card to do anything and this card can kind of be put in the place that like well we know we're eventually going to go there and it could have some yeah i'm just trying to find some trying to find something yeah if anything i am more turned around on this card on maybe keeping this card uh in my collection than i am with most of the ones we've talked about because i feel like the only the purpose of this card at all only occurred to me for the first time <laughs> while we were talking about it which is putting it on the location you're about to move into uh, okay that is more than enough time spent on hiding spot <laughs> the uh the, the last card yeah mm -hmm. all the other cards in Arkham are good yeah uh the last card is devil's luck it's a level one one cost survivor event that says fortune or that's a fortune trait it's fast Play when you are dealt damage and or horror. Cancel up to 10 damage and or horror just dealt to you. Exile, Devil's Luck. Um, theoretically a cool card, right? Like, canceling damage, fast speed, is great. The art is awesome because it's a hat with a bullet hole in it that just got shot off someone's head. Um, the art basically makes me want to put it in my deck alone, along with the flavor text. That was my favorite hat. Spot on. Um, a card came out after this called Perseverance. Have you, do you remember that card? Yeah, that one only cancels like four damage or four. Like, how often do you take more than four damage? But also, heart? Perseverance only works when you die. Like, but how often do you care about canceling damage or horror? It's when it would kill you. You know, I, I know one time that you take 10 damage, and that is in uh, Dunwich. You take uh, 10 damage when you run out of your deck. I feel like Devil's Luck is a perfectly good use for that. <sighs> That's true. Uh, it was this and Quantum Flux. They got printed in the Carcosa cycle and were kind of mm -hmm. like silver bullets for like if you wanted to yeah. throw a card in your deck that just like cancels the Dunwich main mechanic, yeah. <laughs> you can. Um, this is, yeah, you're right. Maybe I'd run this in Dunwich. Uh, but yeah, I don't think that the fact that, pers that Perseverance, it has to be something that would kill you matters because... That's the only time that you're gonna you exile this. You're going to save this until you have to play yeah. it to save yourself, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like if I were going to take six damage or horror, but it was my first six of the game and it wasn't gonna get me that close to death, I probably wouldn't play this because I wouldn't want to exile it and have to buy it again. Yeah, and survivors do have the uh, the one card that discards a treachery in play. Uh, it's three cost. I forget what it's called right now. 
but you could use alter that. Fate. Oh, yeah, yeah, you could alter fate, the thing that gives you 10 damage um, before yes. you run out of your deck. Yeah. So, better use of XP than Devil's yeah. Luck. Then, Because yeah. that's not an exile, so probably a better use. Yeah, I think so. Um, okay, that's it. Those are all the cards that we'll be sacrificing to <laughs> the Elder God of Choice. Yeah. Uh, I think we said we were going to put a poll on our Twitter for which god we should sacrifice it to. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot more than four gods, and a Twitter poll only allows for four options, oh. so we'll have to talk We'll talk yeah. off camera and yeah. narrow, narrow it down some. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm, uh, I'm blindsiding you with this because I didn't tell you uh, to prepare for this, but any cards that you would have included that I didn't? Ooh, uh, that's a good question. Um... Uh, let's see, maybe Relic Hunter? I can't say I've ever used Relic mm, Hunter. Interesting. Uh, because it's permanent, they're, like the downsides are not as... It's it, Almost all of these cards are just like, I would not spend a deck slot or resources on yeah. this, and it's got that uh, going for it. But um, I think Relic Hunter, I think, will have its day. It's true. There's right? no like, limit. They could always print more accessories. Yeah. Um, but also, like, sometimes when making a sacrifice to the Elder Gods, you just have to be, like, confident. You, you, know, you shouldn't, like, <laughs> worry about, like, oh, what if a different Elder God, like, ends up winning the war and, like, taking over the world? Like, you just have to, like, make a choice and stick mm. with it. All right. Valid point. Uh, okay. We'll throw, <laughs> we'll throw Ritual Hunter on the pile, too. <laughs> Relic Hunter. What did I say? Ritual Hunter. Oh, that sounds like a badass card. <laughs> I don't think that one's a thing, though. <laughs> All right, with that, thank you for joining us. Um, I both look forward to and dread your feedback on this one. <laughs> I feel like this was one of the more controversial uh, topics we could have talked about. Yeah. As probably everyone has their, or every card has its defenders. Yeah, I mean, it, like, if you like the card in this group, you know, you should feel bad. You should know that your opinions are bad. Mm -hmm. um, and you should feel dumb. <laughs> That's okay. We, we, we still like you. Uh, you can like bad cards and still be a good person. That's... All right. Now, now you're playing the devil's advocate. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I wanted my turn. <laughs> well, I hope that we have helped you uh, kill... I don't know how long this has been. Another 45 minutes or so of quarantine. <laughs> Thank you for watching. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to Optimal Play, we would love it if you did. We've got lots more videos that you can watch while you're stuck at home. Um, on that note... Be healthy, stay safe, wash your hands, and uh, be optimal. See you next time.